Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Nicole Lamberson. I was trained as a physician assistant, and I volunteer doing outreach for the film Medicating Normal, and I host conversations like this one today. Our guest today is Anne Bracken. Anne is an activist. She's a poet and an author. Her new book, Crash, a memoir of over-medication and recovery, explores mother-daughter depression and chronic pain experiences of struggling in a healthcare system that often ignores women's needs. Crash makes extensive use of primary sources, specifically Anne's father's original records detailing her mother's treatment and Anne's journal account for the years she endured depression and a chronic migraine. Crash serves as a missive to women fighting to heal, carve their own path, and demand better care. So hi, Anne. Welcome, and thanks so much for coming on today. Hi, Nicole. It's great to be here. Sure. Is there anything in your introduction that I left out or anything you want to say about medicating normal before we jump into talking about your book? I was very happy to find the film Medicating Normal, and I've watched it a number of times. Um, both of my kids have watched it, and I've recommended it to a lot of friends. I think it's a really important film. Great. All right. So let's start with your book. Um, why did you write it? What can people expect from it? Who did you hope to, to target with your writing? Um, I wrote it initially after I found Sam Quinones on YouTube, mm -hmm. who was talking about his book, Dreamland, which deals with the beginnings of the opioid epidemic. And when I heard him say, doctors were telling people that you couldn't get addicted if you were taking it for pain, I thought, wow, I've never heard that. That's what happened to me. Mm -hmm. I need to write this. I need to write a book. And I had already written a poetry book to explore my experiences growing up and my mother's experiences. Um, but I felt like a fuller picture was really needed to look at the issues of depression and, and talk to people about, you know, the, the very real harms that can come from the medications and especially the whole notion of polypharmacy, taking so many drugs at one time. <laughs> So you had written a lot of poetry books and stuff before. I, I've met a lot of people who have endured, you know, psychiatric drug injury, who talk about writing a book and telling their story. How difficult was it? How time consuming? That kind of thing. Um, it took me about five years to write the book. Wow. And I was primarily writing poetry before I wrote the memoir. So I was not a practiced, I was, I was an okay prose writer, but I wasn't a memoir writer, which is something different altogether. So I would say I probably wrote the book four or five times, working with two different editors and even hiring a book doctor to help me craft the story and create scenes that would make the situations real for the reader. Wow. Okay. So it was quite involved. Yes. <clears throat> so maybe for people who haven't read the book, but who are interested in, you know, getting a copy, um, could you give us like a short summary, you know, without giving everything away of your story and your mother's story and how they, you know, are sort of connected? Okay. So when I grew up in the late fifties and early sixties, my mother suffered from postpartum depression. And, you know, as I grew up and watched her and, and watched her also self-medicate with alcohol, you know, to me, depression was the most terrifying illness because it looked like you never got better. That was my only experience with depression, somebody who never got better. Mm -hmm. And so as a, a very determined child and then adolescent, I remember saying, this is never going to happen to me. I will never be like this, like this, whatever like this means. But, mm. um, you know, basically I, I, I saw my mother very over-medicated and stumbling around at times and having accidents and 
not ever getting well for more than maybe a couple of weeks at a time. So as I grew up, I, um, I experienced some depression in my 20s, but it was after I got married and after I had my own children. And my ex-husband was not at all supportive. I think he was equally terrified of the notion of me being depressed. He kept thinking I would be like my mother and never get well. So he was very unsupportive of taking medication and even going to therapy. So the two times that I experienced depression, I was super determined to get well, whatever that means. And I, I took um, Elville, which is a very old antidepressant and it seemed to work. And I got off of it very easily. Mm. But as I, as I kept going in the marriage, um, we kept going to therapy, things did not improve for very long. And I, I felt like we were just kind of at a stalemate and we'd done whatever we could do. And all of a sudden I was hit with a very severe migraine headache that um, did not resolve for seven years. And at the same time, I struggled with severe um, depression for four years. So I think I heard you right that you said your husband at the time was not supportive of you taking medication. Right. Do you think that was more about just not being supportive of you or that he was suspicious of the medications and no, he was, he was raised in a family that always denied illness. Um, they, his father used to say he hadn't been sick a day in his life since World War II. And uh, anytime I was sick, even with the cold or the flu, it was like, tough it out, work it out, just get through this. I think he was, I think he was really pretty terrified of illness and especially depression. Yeah. Okay. So your mom was <clears throat> very depressed and, and using alcohol when you were a child and, and you watched all of this. So what, what do you think that did to you as you moved into adulthood and you started having your own depression? Like how did that frame, I guess, how you viewed depression in your mind? I just think of like all the doctors, uh, that you go to will say, you know, well, I shouldn't say all, uh, uh, probably a significant portion of psychiatrists will say there's a genetic component. And if your mom was like this, then you're going to be like this and it makes sense and that kind of thing. So is that sort of the thinking you had or what you were yes. told? Yes, yeah. that's exactly what I was told that it runs in families that I was probably like my mother, whatever that meant. And, um, and that, but in the beginning, they did say, you know, you will get well. I think the first two times that I don't even think they recommended therapy. I just saw a male psychiatrist. One time I saw my mother's psychiatrist, whom I really didn't like. Mm -hmm. And they gave me, um, like I said, Elville, that was the only drug I took. And when I started to feel better, I tapered myself off of it. Okay. But there was no therapy in the beginning. They were just telling me it was hereditary. And, you know, inside, I'm terrified. I'm thinking, I don't want this to be hereditary. I don't want to fight with this my whole life. And I didn't have a very holistic understanding of depression at all. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you think was your understanding at the time? I, I think I just felt like it was maybe the circumstances in my life. Like the second time I, I experienced depression was after I had my second child. Mm -hmm. And I also had a breast infection the first week she was born. And I had nursed her too much and I had bleeding nipples. So I was really physically quite a mess. And then she was up every four hours for months. So I think I was really exhausted. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So how did it come to be then that you took multiple psychiatric medications and then you also had ECT, correct? Yes. So in 1993, when I first 
had the migraine headache and I began to experience depression, I, I went to one doctor after another and um, they, the first doctor told me there was something in my affect and I didn't even know what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. And he gave me some kind of drug. It was an SSRI because it was 93. Um, and it didn't work. So he gave me another one. And then he said, I think you need to see a psychiatrist. So I started seeing a psychiatrist and he gave me a couple of drugs. And I was also feeling very anxious, which now I wonder was I anxious because of feeling depressed or was I anxious because of the effects of the drugs I was taking? Mm -hmm. But nothing that I took helped me to feel better. And I went to doctor after doctor trying all kinds of drugs and combinations of drugs. And they, the first drug they put me on for the migraine was Elevil. They said Elevil can help with pain. It's been shown to help with migraines. It didn't do anything except make me very, very sleepy and constipated and gain weight. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it didn't do what it was supposed to do. And uh, after a couple of years, my one psychiatrist got, I guess he got frustrated with me and he just threw my file across the room and said, you know, I'm sending you to Hopkins. I deal with, they deal with people like you all the time. So when I went to Hopkins, I saw some doctor for less than an hour and um, he, his final question to me was, well, how did you feel when you took Elevil? And I said, I felt like a party girl. And he said, what does that mean? And I said, I was just really happy and I felt great. And he said, how long did that last? I said, two or three days. And he said, well, that's two or three days too long. You, you have mild atypical hypomania. And you know, mm. so here I get an, a whole new diagnosis. You know? yeah. And then they start giving me mood regulators on top of the antidepressants and the Elevil and the Valium. Mm -hmm. So it was, yeah. it was quite a mess. And when, the, and when those drugs, several more drugs didn't work, I... I felt, I literally felt suicidal. I couldn't stop thinking about suicide. And I didn't want to do that. My mother had tried to commit suicide and I knew what that had done to me and, and my family. And I didn't want to put my children through that. So I, I asked for ECT. That mm -hmm. was the only thing in my mind that was left. Mm -hmm. Before the drugs, were you suicidal or do you think the drugs contributed to your suicidality? I, when I look back at the drugs that I was taking and the effects that they can have, I think it was the drugs contributing to my feelings of suicidality. I mean, it lasted for a couple of years. That's, you know, that's not a transitory feeling of desperation. Yeah. I don't think. Yeah. So you went through with having ECT then, did that help you? What was it like? I can't say that it really helped me. I, I, I um, might've felt better for a day or two and felt hopeful uh, when my doctor would tell me that it was a so-called good treatment. Um, but one time I had a treatment and he used a technique where he gave four shocks of, under one anesthesia. Mm. And I remember sleeping for a week. Wow. Um, and now I think that could have been a sign of some kind of brain trauma. Mm -hmm. I don't think that was a normal reaction at all that I, all I wanted to do was sleep. Yeah. Do you have lasting effects now from the ECT? I have big black holes in my memory, yes. Mm. Yes, yeah. I would say that's the worst lasting effect that I have. So I'm going to ask you a question that, that someone in my family asked me, and I, I know what my answer is for why, but so all of these drugs and treatments and things aren't working, or you're getting sicker and sicker, you're deteriorating, I guess, then one wants to know, well, why did you keep 
taking them? Why did you continue to see a psychiatrist and go through with the treatments, do you think, at the time? I think I was really still very much believing in the medical model. Mm -hmm. I was, I didn't fully buy into the chemical imbalance idea. I fought that for a long time. And then it, everybody around me kept saying it and talking about it. And that was when listening to Prozac came out and people were talking about how wonderful Prozac was. I think I was just stuck in that, in that model and the whole idea that if you have something like depression, the person that can help you is a psychiatrist, mm -hmm. even though they weren't helping. And then of course I get to be called treatment resistant, which I, <laughs> I really resent because they never ask the question, is it the right treatment? Mm -hmm. They just focus on you and make it your fault. Yeah, exactly. When my answer was, well, I had become so sick on all of the medications and deteriorated and such so much that you just continue trying things because you feel so awful and desperate to feel better. And like you said, you're so sort of brainwashed by the mainstream way of thinking and what these doctors are telling you and reinforcing in you that you really do think that it's you, that it's some you know, defect within yourself that has to be fixed or altered or changed. And so you don't even recognize that the treatments are part of the problem until, you know, if you're lucky enough to get that, that sort of light bulb moment. Right. Um, we'll talk, I guess, about, you know, the light bulb moment for you or where everything switched. But first, I want to ask about, you know, you talk about your, your migraines and, or chronic pain and depression. So, um, you think there's a relationship between the two? What would you say that is? I think from my very earliest years that I learned a powerful lesson in my family that it was okay to be physically ill and that you got positive attention and nurturing for being physically ill, but you did not get a positive response for being emotionally unwell. And my first experience with something showing up in my body and I think being related to my emotions was when my mother was seven and she, she went away to a psychiatric hospital for six months and no one would tell us where she was. And when no one told us when she was coming home, I mean, it was a really very difficult time. And I started having stomach aches every day. And after a few weeks, my father finally took me to the pediatrician and the pediatrician just said, she needs to eat more breakfast. So I think that was the first time that my body was really talking to me. And then mm. In my 20s, when I moved in with my boyfriend, who later became my husband, I started experiencing um, very bad stomach pain every month. And I went through a whole uh, experience of tests and all kinds of things to find the problem. They never found a problem. After I had my daughter, before I recognized I had depression, I had intense pelvic pain for months. So I, I think it was my own response to my situation. I knew that it wasn't safe really to, you know, collapse into tears or to say I need help and to feel low and down. Um, I, I, it came up in my body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Before we went live and <clears throat> pressed record or whatever, we were talking about that and how, um, you know, everyone will sort of have you think that your, your head and the rest of your body are separate and what goes on up here can affect the rest of you, but it's really silly, uh, thinking that way because so many things emotionally and in your environment and life that's affecting you uh, manifests physically, you know, yeah. <clears throat> but I don't think people really connect that, that they can be interrelated with each other. No, they don't. Yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> so when you took the medications for migraines, like pain pills, uh, like opioids and that kind of thing, was it helpful for, you know, at least numbing the pain or treating it in some way? You know, unfortunately, I can't really say that I remember, but what I do remember is that nothing really helped for very long. Nothing got rid of the pain completely. So even taking MS cotton, which is a form of morphine or Oxycontin or methadone, none of those things got rid of the pain completely. I think they just numbed me to the point where, you know, I didn't care as much, but nothing got rid of the pain. In fact, I was hospitalized five times for the migraine. Wow. So they were in intensely yes. bad migraines. They were horrible. They were debilitating and they were all day, every day for seven years. Wow. So at what point did you sort of have this shift in your thinking then where you started to put things together that the treatments and the drugs were risky or, or harmful and that this polypharmacy perhaps was not solving your issues and maybe even making you worse? Well, in 97, after four years of feeling depressed, I finally started to feel better. And my psychiatrist kept me on a regimen of four drugs um, as maintenance, which I was willing to do because I was believing that they were necessary. And at the same time, I was on about four or five different headache drugs an injectable and nasal spray, the Oxycontin, and I had um, injectable Demerol at home for what the nurse called my really bad days. Mm -hmm. So I was volunteering at Hopkins in a, a program that was a support program for people with depression. And I was coming home one afternoon and I swerved across a highway five times and crashed into a guardrail. Mm. And when I, you know, looked up, there were people walking towards me and I thought that I had hurt someone mm. and I was terrified, but you know, they were concerned about me seeing my driving. So I got back in the car, went home. I didn't say anything about it. I didn't think about it again. It, it didn't compute, you know, I was, I was in denial, really. I was like, well, that was a one-off. I'm, I'm just going to keep going. And then a couple of weeks later, I was again driving home. And this time I was in the city. And um, <clears throat> it was a very warm winter day. The car was filled with sunshine. It was, you know, really a pleasant afternoon. And I pulled up to a stoplight. And the next thing I knew, I woke up with an airbag in my chest and smoke in my car. I had crashed into a van in front of me. Wow. And um, after that crash, I immediately went home that night and called a good friend of mine because I thought, you know, here I am in the middle of the city. People walk across that street all the time, especially if traffic is stopped. I really could have killed somebody. I wasn't thinking about killing myself. I was thinking the worst thing would be if I killed somebody else. Yeah. And at that moment, I, I realized that I had a friend who said she had worked with an energy healer and that it was very successful. So I, I called the energy healer. I was, I was like, this stuff is not working. This, you know, here's two car crashes. This is, this is not working. I have to do something different. Mm -hmm. So you, th you thought or realized then that the medications contributed to you crashing your car. They impaired you that much or. I, I think at some level I realized it. I just knew that everything I was doing for pain with mm -hmm. the migraine was not working. Yeah. Um, I, I believe that I was so numb that I didn't feel the, the fear and the terror that can come from being in car accidents like that. Mm -hmm. I just knew that I, that this wasn't working. I had to stop taking these drugs. Okay. So <clears throat> what eventually do you think did help you? Like what kind of alternatives did you use and that kind of thing? 
the energy healer that I worked with did something called chakra energy clearing. And at that time, this was in 2000, I didn't know what a chakra was. I'd never heard of, you know, electrical energy in your body or anything like that. So it was a complete suspension of disbelief to work with her. I just knew that I had to do something different. And she would, um, I would lie down in my bed. She was in another part of town. And after we talked on the phone, we'd hang up and she would go through my chakras and clear my chakras. And then she'd call me up and tell me, you know, tell me what she saw in my body. She, I, I mean, really, I know it sounds very far out, but it, it definitely worked. And the pain started lessening the more, <clears throat> the more treatments I got. Mm -hmm. And then at some point she said, I want you to take flower essences. Again, never heard of it. She explained that this doctor, Dr. Bach had discovered that certain flowers have certain properties related to emotions in the body. And I said, okay, I'm taking methadone and you want me to take flower essences. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll try it. I'll do what you say because the pain was decreasing and nothing else had gotten it to decrease. Mm -hmm. And after working with her for four months, um, sometimes twice a week, all the pain was gone. I was off of all the medication and I was able to, to leave my marriage, which I'd been unhappy in for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, so did you have to taper off of the drugs or were you able to just stop them? And did you, you know, enlist your psychiatrist in getting off or how did that go? I, I worked with the headache nurse to taper off the headache drugs. And the primary one that I had to get off of was methadone. Mm -hmm. And I just remember not so much feeling withdrawal from stopping the methadone, but not being able to sleep. That was the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I had a couple of weeks of really difficult sleep. And I remember my psychiatrist giving me Depakote for a short period of time, because I knew that would make me sleep. Um, it, it, was, it was kind of a mess doing all that, but I did work with the he headache doctor and when I finally went to her in May of that year, and I said, I don't have a headache anymore. And, you know, I, I'm not taking any drugs anymore. She, she just couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. So after all of this and you're doing better and you've gotten yourself off of all of the medications and everything, um, you know, I find that hindsight in all of this is very powerful for most people. They can look back and say, you know, oh, it was this or that. Or mm -hmm. so what do you think ultimately caused your depression and your migraines and the mm -hmm. same for your mother? What do you think uh, was really the contributing cause of why she was so ill? I think I'll, I'll take my mother first. I think, um, she probably was definitely suffering from some postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. And when I look at our home life, she had four children under the age of seven. She had no car and my father worked ship work. So he would rotate two or three weeks at a time of working eight to four, four to 12, and then 12 to eight. So he was always home at a different time, sleeping at a different time. And mom had to just keep everything steady in the household with these very young children and really no, no support. You know, it was, it was the fifties and sixties. And the idea was that, you know, you have all these kids and you just handle everything. Mm -hmm. And I think she was, she was a very sensitive person. She was very artistic. And I just think she needed more support and she needed more she needed something for herself too. I really do think she needed something for herself. And what I discovered after I found my father's records was, you know, I realized very quickly that she really didn't have a chance once she started taking um, drugs. They, they gave her six drugs in six weeks 
amphetamines, barbiturates, two types of antidepressants, and one drug that was a combination amphetamine and barbiturate. And mm -hmm. I think she just collapsed. I mean, who could handle all that? Yeah. And then you mentioned the alcohol too. I think people get into a, uh, I don't know the right word, but it's sort of like when I used to smoke cigarettes, I felt like when I would smoke and I would feel better that the cigarette was helping me. It was helping my anxiety or whatever, but really what it was doing was squelching the withdrawal from the last cigarette that I had, but people don't put that connection together. So it's the same thing with psychiatric medications, like benzodiazepines, when you're having inner dose withdrawal, and then you take another benzo and you feel better, they think the benzo is helping with the anxiety, but it's really just helping with the withdrawal from the previous benzo that's running out and, you know, and the same thing with alcohol. So right. you get caught up in this chemical type of stew thing and you do think you're helping yourself, but you're really just staving off these, these withdrawals and alcohol, as you know, can cause significant uh, depression in people. Yes. Same with benzodiazepines and barbiturates and all of that. So once all the drugs are involved, it's like, well, who's to say, how could you suss out that it's just organic coming from the person when they have so many chemicals and things affecting their system, you know? And when I looked at my dad had a list of all the drugs that mom had taken for 30 years. And when I looked at the drugs and then started um, exploring what their effects were, the two symptoms that my mother suffered from the most were anxiety and insomnia. And so many of the drugs that she took caused that. Mm -hmm. So I think she was using the alcohol to counteract the insomnia and the anxiety, but she was still taking the drugs. Mm -hmm. so, so it was a, a terrible cycle that she was trapped in. Yeah. And so did she ever get free of anything or what was the end of her story? Uh, one time she was hospitalized in the 70s and the doctor took her off of all medication in the hospital and maybe put her back on just one or two drugs and detoxed her from the alcohol. And I remember that was the best I ever saw her. She came home, she was happy, she was lighter, she, she was with her friends more, but she couldn't sustain it. You know, there was no support um, in the family for her to really stop drinking. Mm -hmm. I don't think people put that together at the time. Yeah. So, and then she unfortunately developed esophageal cancer in her eighties and that's what she died from. Yeah. I feel really sad and also, you know, just upset for the people who were medicated before the internet because mm -hmm. Uh, I can't imagine what it would have been like to go through all of this, you know, trying to figure out what's wrong with you. And finally, we're so lucky that we have the web where we can connect with each other and we can read other people's stories and we can even know that like your book exists, you know, out there, sure. even talking to like Geraldine Burns, um, who was big in starting a lot of the Benzo movement you know, they, before the internet were like, I don't know how they found each other. I, I'd have to have her on and ask her. Mm -hmm. um, but they were, I think there was like the first sproutings of the internet where there were like, it was barely anything, but you could still sort of connect with people. And they were like handwriting each other letters wow. to connect about this stuff. But pre that, you know, your mother's uh, time, how would you even know that? Well, you wouldn't. And, you know, in looking into the history of psychiatric treatment, I did find some very old journal articles that talked about doctors' attitudes towards, towards patients, but also primarily women um, in regards to electroconvulsive therapy and insulin coma shock. Mm -hmm. And um, this one journal article quoted things that doctors and nurses said about their patients. And it was awful. Oh. You know, they, they were using ECT as punishment for, you know, difficult patients or 
somebody who was too mouthy with her husband thing it I, it was it was terrible absolutely yeah. terrible and then i found a whole trove of um old journal advertisements from the 50s and 60s for psychiatric drugs and that that just gave me the story of how doctors looked at women because advertising reflects the the um attitudes of the time and the women were all portrayed as housewives um doing household chores or unable to do household chores and the first drug that they started giving people the first drug they gave my mother um was an amphetamine and so they were advertising ritalin and saying how it was able to help this woman get back to her chores and make dinner and be peppy <laughs> so it was it was obvious how they saw women mm -hmm. and how women were were treated and then i think you know in my case i all i all but one psychiatrist were men and I, I do think there's that very much that male idea of the, the little woman and what she should be. And, you know, even in the 90s, I think it was like that. Mm -hmm. and you know, I read something on on the Internet again. <laughs> lucky us that we have it now and we can connect. But it's it kind of was a light bulb moment for me for uh, maybe putting the pieces together of why, you know, men psychiatrists tend to view women uh, in some instances as hysterical or, and I, I thought like, it's because they don't, we aren't each other. Like what better understanding do you have of another person if you're able to experience something, right? So you understand uh, really well my story and me yours because we've both shared going through this stuff with taking psychiatric meds and stuff you right. could try to explain to somebody with your voice but if you've never taken them then maybe you wouldn't truly understand so i was on reddit or something and i was reading um from a transgendered person who was transitioning mm -hmm. and said they never fully understood like the differences between how men feel and women feel until they started taking hormones and they completely started when they were transitioning to a woman started feeling all of these emotions and things that they had never in their life experienced before as um you know when they were a man and they weren't taking these hormones so i thought oh that makes a lot of sense like that maybe they just can't understand that you know, women are more emotional and different in a way, um, just because just by nature of hormones and that kind of thing. So, I mean, it's not excusable. It's not an excuse, of course, but it just sort of was like, oh, that, that makes a little bit of sense to me reading that. So, right. and I, I also think it's related to, and I talk about this in the book, the model that people operate within. So in medicine, they tend to operate within the model of using drugs, just using drugs for everything. Whatever's wrong, there's a drug for that. Mm -hmm. And they don't necessarily think about drug combining. Um, so for example, the polypharmacy that I experienced when I had the car accidents, I was taking nine or 10 different drugs. Yeah. That's just awful. You, you, can't do that to somebody and have them function properly yeah and we have zero idea what happens when we combine medications in that way it's, it's simply not studied you know right. imagine how many studies you'd have to do to do all of the drug combinations and then it would have to be in a white middle-aged woman a white you know child a black person a man a because it's all different, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, I want to take you back because I don't think you answered. You answered for your mom, but for yourself, what do you think ultimately in hindsight caused your depression and migraines? I really think it was my very painful marriage. Um, I had been struggling in my marriage 
for years. Uh, my ex-husband and I had gone to therapy any number of times, but nothing, nothing improved for very long. I, I think about it as a roller coaster, like it was mostly a very long, steep uphill pull. And then there was a brief exhilaration, downhill, feeling better, and but things never got better for very long. And I think after 20 years, I was, you know, at, at this deeper level, really feeling like I, I was questioning the whole thing. I was questioning the whole marriage. Mm -hmm. And I had been raised a Catholic <clears throat> and I was very committed to my vows and my marriage. But I was also committed to, <laughs> to my health. Mm -hmm. And, um, and to, and to being happy in the relationship. And I, I knew that I wasn't really happy in the relationship. And then when I did experience depression, I think what it did was it exacerbated his verbal and emotional abuse to the point where I could see it. Mm -hmm. Because up until then, it was all masked by teasing. You know, I'm just teasing, you know, I love you. Don't take it so seriously. But it was always this pick, pick, pick of never being right about anything and always being able to improve one more inch or something like that. Mm -hmm. So um, I think by the time I finally felt the depression lift and I still had the migraine, I knew I wanted to get out of the marriage, but I, I had to get rid of the, the migraine pain before I could go back to work. Yeah. <clears throat> so <clears throat> excuse me everybody I, should, I meant to say at the beginning if I'm clearing or whatever I'm getting over the end of COVID here so um <clears throat> what what lesson do you think then do you wish to impart on people um you know based on your story uh looking back you think all of this stemmed from staying in a bad sort of abusive situation what would you like other people to think about who are feeling depressed or having, you know, migraines and that kind of thing? Well, what I say to people when I talk about my story and about not taking any more psychiatric or pain medication, um, I tell them, you know, everybody I've ever met who has experienced depression has a really good reason for feeling depressed. Mm -hmm. there's something in their life that is very painful and it could be in the past it could be those childhood traumatic experiences that you that you kind of keep re-encountering as you go through adulthood maybe you re-encounter those things with a boss or even a friend or a spouse and it it does bring you down but you know Thankfully, what I discovered um, in doing a lot of reading about depression was that it does have a purpose. Mm -hmm. It, you know, the, the down feeling makes you withdraw from your normal life. You don't, you don't feel like being social. You don't feel like um, taking on a whole lot of responsibility. And in a way, that gives you some space to really explore what's going on in your life. Mm -hmm. it's not easy because there, there aren't enough therapists out there. And I know a lot of therapists are still believing in the medical model, but I would encourage people to, um, to like, look at Gabor Mate's work, mm -hmm. um, his newest book, The Myth of Normal. And I don't remember the author's name, but he wrote a book called um, What Happened to You? Mm -hmm. And he said, the most important question we can ask people is not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. And I, that's, that's what I would say to people, if they could look at their lives, you know, and, and just ask what happened to me, what happened that might be making me feel this way. Yeah. <clears throat> it seems so simple, but I, I, no, in my own circumstance, I didn't really start to connect the dots of that kind of thinking until I was injured by psychiatry. And another uh, survivor of benzodiazepines said in some of his writings, Matt Samet, you may have read some of his stuff on Mad America. He's a brilliant 
writer just said something so basic in one of his writings like um I once I got off of all the medications and I started to heal I I started to realize that a lot of the things that I was feeling were just my body trying to send me a message, you know, my body trying to communicate with me. Well, yes. you know, maybe you're anxious because what is the old quote? Like, just make sure you're not surrounded by assholes, <laughs> you know, it's just right. basic, simple things. But I think people, if you really are, <clears throat> um, surrounded by all of this mainstream messaging, you don't, you don't look at it that way that, yeah, it makes sense that I'm depressed because I'm trapped in this horrible marriage or the situation making me miserable every single day. Instead, you're told, oh, it's your chemistry or your mom was this way. So, you know, you're right. this way, but when so it's, it's, re- it's like inescapable that you, yeah. you know, there's, there's no real reason for it. I can remember saying to doctors, you mean to tell me that one day I'm fine And then another day my chemicals go off and I'm screwed up for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I said, that doesn't really make any sense to me, but they wouldn't budge. They had bought into that so firmly. And, you know, thankfully, um, the, so first I got off the pain medicine, but I was still taking all the psychiatric drugs. And the way that I got off of them was thankfully I was teaching at the university of Maryland and several of my students started researching the overprescription of SSRIs. Mm-hmm. And I was reading their papers and thinking, well, I've never heard any of this before. Mm-hmm. Who is this Joseph Glenmullen that they keep talking about? And I went to the library and got his book. At, um, it's called Prozac Backlash, written mm-hmm. in, I believe, 2000. And this was 2002 when I was reading it. And I, I started reading it and I thought, I've never heard any of this before. And he was talking about all of his patients that had very negative effects from antidepressants mm-hmm. and about the, the whole um, ineffectiveness loop that you can get into where it stops working at one dose and you take more and then it stops working and you take more. And what it's doing in your brain, he started explaining all that that's what got me off of psychiatric drugs. And, and then when he talked about tardive dyskinesia, um, I realized that my mother had that. And I thought, there, this is one giant experiment. The oh, yeah. drugs that I'm taking are so new, I'm, I'm not going to be part of this experiment anymore. Mm-hmm. And so I worked with my therapist. I didn't really tell my doctor because he was insisting that I take the drugs or... Uh, I was going to be very ill and I talked to my therapist and she, she helped me to taper and get off the drugs. Yeah. So aside from the memory loss that you mentioned, do you feel like you have any lasting effects from your time in the psychiatric system? (laughs) Though I think the, the one effect that I'm dealing with right now is the um, PTSD from the two car accidents because I um, didn't feel anything at all when I had the accidents. I wasn't terrified, I wasn't afraid. And it was five or six years ago, I started getting severe anxiety driving on the highway. And I would have all these things that would go through my head, imagine all kinds of terrible things. And, and I'd say, I've never lost control of my car. I've never lost control of my car. And this just kept going on intermittently for several years until about three years ago my daughter and I were in the mountains and she was sleeping and I was driving home and I I could barely drive and when I got home and started meditating and saying I've never lost control of my car this little boy said yes you have and um you know then I I connected my feelings of anxiety on the highway especially related to mountains because one of the accidents happened on a steep hill Mm. and I think it was the mountains that evoked the hill so anyway I did go to a practitioner and do some EMDR for a couple of months to manage that but it's still it's a real choice to 
to go on the highway. And yeah. I, I use a weighted blanket. <laughs> I use lavender. I take some rescue remedy. I mean, I really have to work to get on the highway. Yeah. And that, that really makes me angry that, you know, that happened to me and it's 20 some years later and I'm still dealing with it. So that would be the biggest effect. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Let's go back to women, uh, since we touched on that. You mentioned that you think the healthcare system ignores women's needs. How so? I just, I don't feel like I'm really listened to when I go to male doctors. Mm -hmm. And when I read the kinds of things that they write, um, I just, I just feel like they're dismissive of of women's concerns and that we're viewed as being weaker and um, not as not as competent as men. And I also think modern medicine has just a very mechanistic viewpoint about how to handle what we like to call health. You know, it's either cut something out or drug you or, um, you know, give you some kind of prophylactic for it. It's not about health, which is going inside and looking at what could be causing all of this. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll add too, though, I think there's women doctors who aren't very tuned in to other women patients either. I've, you know, for even like hormonal things, I've gone to women doctors and been just like shocked at how little they knew you know, or cared being a woman themselves. So, you know. Right. I think it is the medical model. I, yeah. I just think there is a distancing um, between the doctor and the patient and they see themselves as being better, more knowledgeable. They don't want to entertain other possibilities. They're just contained in their model of how they see the human system working. Yeah. <clears throat> So we have just a few minutes left. I guess we should maybe close with um, what would you like to see, you know, change, I guess, in the current paradigm of, of mental health treatment or just, you know, medicine in general? You know, I think that's the biggest challenge that those of us who are on the other side and who realize the very real limitations and harms of the system are are trying to address in some way and you know what i say to my friends when they tell me that maybe they feel depressed or maybe they feel anxious i will say well you know you have every reason to feel anxious you don't necessarily need a drug mm -hmm. you know this is what's happening in your life no wonder you feel this way so i just try to put things in a different context for people so that they don't automatically go for the go for the drug. I think I think it's good. I don't I try not to use the word depression because of all that it carries with it. I talk about emotional distress mm -hmm. that it's normal as a human being to feel emotional distress and at times to feel very low. And that there are ways to manage that that are not going to harm you. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a, a gigantic task because, um, you know, the big pharma has so much money. And whenever somebody comes out like Joanna Moncrief and Mark Horowitz with their study, they just get hammered mm -hmm. by the um, establish, establishment psychiatrists. And they're backed by all the money. Mm -hmm. So it, it's hard, but I think it's a really important um, cause yeah. to be taking on. And how, how has that messaging been received? So you've written this book and you've got friends who I assume aren't, you know, as learned on, on everything as you are, because most people you interact with and talk to have no idea about any of this stuff. They were like we were when we right. were trusting and accepting. So um, <clears throat> how do your friends and the people that you give this messaging to, or who've read your book, how they received things? They're, the responses I've gotten about the book are very positive. Mm -hmm. And 
they usually tell me they never knew most of what I was talking about and that they appreciate that I wrote about it and mm -hmm. told my story and my mother's story. I think the hardest thing for me is a lot of times just, you know, recognizing that everybody does have a right to do whatever they want to do. And there are many friends that want to take the medication. And I, I just feel like, you know, I, I need to respect that as much as I want people to respect my choice not to take it. I need to respect other people's choice. And what I advocate for is fully informed consent, mm -hmm. knowing the harms and the pluses and the alternatives and being told that right up front before you start anything. And that's not just in psychiatry. I think that applies to all of medicine, really. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> that's I had one friend who was a patient in a psychiatric, or she was going to go into a psychiatric hospital and she had already been a few times and she was having a lot of uh, problems. And I said to her, before they give you any new medication, make sure you get informed consent. And she said, what is that? Yeah. So people do not know what informed consent is, even though it's been around as a concept and a practice for a long time. Yeah. And even if people are getting some level of it, I don't believe that they ever are getting the full thing because, you know, could you, without having been through horrific benzodiazepine withdrawal or ECT, you know, could you really put into words for somebody what the possibilities are? You know, I don't know that the, the patients are getting that. They might be told, oh, well, you could you know, have some memory loss or, but can they get the texture of how bad it would be or how much it would affect them to have that as a, an adverse effect? So. No, it's hard, but I, you know, like I interact with a lot of other writers at Mad in America and I'm always saying, Hey, look, we got to keep poking holes in the dike. That's mm -hmm. what we're doing. We're, we're just actively poking holes in the dike. Yeah. You know, there's more of us than there are of them. <laughs> yeah, very yeah. true. And every little bit <clears throat> helps, you know, even if you <clears throat> get a message saying, oh, your book helped me see this or that it's one person, but that, that person matters, you know, that you've reached them. So, Absolutely. yeah, well, I think we are out of time, I guess, before we go, do you have any closing thoughts or, uh, if anybody wants to find you, where can they uh, locate you? My website is located at annbrackenauthor.com. And um, I have a lot of blog posts there. My book is also available there. And I, you can contact me um, through the website if you want to write to me. I'd be happy to talk with you. I'm also on Facebook if you want to. Uh, instant message me and and have a conversation okay so we'll put links to uh all of Anne's social media and her website and everything below in the uh, video description and also a link to her book crash if you want to read it you can get it on amazon so thank you so much for joining us today for this live discussion if you have not seen medicating normal yet Check out our website at medicatingnormal.com slash watch for the many ways you can watch it. <clears throat> you can also buy a DVD now if you're in the United States or Puerto Rico. Check our events tab on Facebook for more scheduled upcoming interviews like this one. <clears throat> and if you'd like to support us at the film, you can do so at medicatingnormal.com slash donate. So thanks again, Anne, for being here and telling your story and writing your book. It was great to chat with you. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And we will see you, I think, next week. We have another interview planned. So tune in if you'd like to. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Anne. Thanks, Take Nicole. Care. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.